Hello, and welcome to the second part of the Linux Voice Introduction to Linux. This uh, follows from the, the first part, obviously, which dealt mostly in the theory and some of the ideas behind what Linux is and how it came to be. Um, in the second part, we're actually going to take a look at installing um, Linux Mint, which is one of the most popular versions of Linux you can get your hands on. And in fact, it's on the very first Linux Voice DVD. Uh, this is the DVD that comes with the very first issue of Linux Voice. Um, for more details on that, go to linuxvoice.com, uh, where you'll be able to subscribe, but also you'll be able to share your experiences with other uh, Linux users, um, many of whom we hope will be new to Linux as well. Um, I'm Graham Morrison. I'm on the team at Linux Voice. Um, and over the next 15 minutes, you'll see a computer transformed uh, from ordinary PC to an awesome, incredible Linux machine. Right, we're assuming that you're booting a machine off the DVD. We've put the DVD in the drive. Uh, your PC will need to be configured to uh, boot off that drive, uh, either through the boot menu, which uh, you usually get to by pressing F12 or similar when you uh, turn your machine on and then choosing the optical drive, or by changing the BIOS settings if your computer still has them. It's also possible to create um, a Linux install that boots off a USB stick um, and we'll cover that in uh, a later video tutorial if you need uh, to boot off a USB stick on a, a laptop for example that doesn't have an optical drive but hopefully you'll see this screen this is the boot menu um, and it allows you to choose between whatever operating systems you can boot into off the disk uh, uh, our first DVD, you can boot into Linux Mint and you can boot into Fedora, another widely used uh, Linux distribution. But we're going to go with Mint. Uh, Linux Mint is um, a live uh, Linux operating system. That means that you can boot directly into a working operating system, a working desktop, straight off the optical drive or the USB stick. Um, and you can then use that just as you can um, a computer with an operating system installed on it. It's great for getting a feel of what Linux Mint is like. Um, it's great for repairing your system if it gets broken or accessing files. Um, and Fedora does the same thing. But uh, some distributions uh, boot straight into an installer, which is which may be how you're more used to this if you've installed Windows before. The only downside to using a live uh, distribution like this is that your files won't be saved on the file system unless you do special things to make them save. Um, which means you have to either email them to yourself or perhaps save them on a USB stick. Um, that's because the operating system is effectively running from RAM. It's not running off the hard drive. Um, so that's something to bear in mind if you do get stuck into uh, the live version of Mint and forget after staying up all night writing your stream of consciousness novel or, or something similar. Right, there we are. Um, that's the default background. This is the uh, <laughs> Linux desktop. You can see you can access files on the uh, DVD. Um, you can also open up a web browser and networking should be working. Um, if, you, if you're doing this on a laptop, then uh, hopefully your wireless has been detected and you'll see a little wireless uh, symbol down in the bottom right. You can click on that and join an access point in the same way that you should be used to in Windows or any other Linux distribution. Um, tons of software already installed and ready to go. Um, Jeep Hardhead is what we're going to load up because the first thing to think about is where to install your Linux distribution. And this is where you've got to be slightly careful um, because you do have the potential of overwriting an operating system that's already installed on your computer. So for example, if you have only one drive and Windows is already installed on your machine, you're going to have to resize the part of that drive that's used by Windows to make space for Linux. You could overwrite all of the data and destroy your Windows partition and all the data that's stored on there, so you do have to be careful. We'd recommend, if at all possible, using a complete drive for Linux um, and hopefully maybe in a machine that doesn't have a drive installed where you can possibly mess up, especially at the beginning. Um, when you've, you're finding your feet. Um, but if you do know what you're doing and how your drives, your storage is structured, um, GParted will tell you everything you need to know about what's installed. So uh, as you may have just seen there, we, on our system, we do have Windows 7 installed. 
um, on a drive. It's called SDA here, 40 gigabytes. And we're going to leave that alone. We're not going to touch it. We're not going to resize it. Um, we're going to create our own completely blank Linux installation on this second drive, um, this second 10 gig drive. Um, as this drive is completely new, um, you actually have to create a partition table on it first. But you, if you've ever used your drive before, you won't have to do that. Um, of course, the caveat, you're going to lose all data doing this to whichever drive you select. And it's the same when you go on to install Linux through the Linux Mint uh, installer as well. And in fact, that's all you have to do. Um, you can manually create partitions here, um, but we're not going to do this. We're going to, we're going to let the Linux Mint installer do this. Um, just make sure you, you know the topography of your drive layout. So this is, you know, this is the drive SDB. It's blank. It's where we're going to install Linux. It's not SDA, which already has Windows installed. Um, so close that. Open up Linux Mint installer. Um, it runs directly from the desktop. You can do it at any time after you've spent however long you need to spend playing with Linux Mint. Uh, it takes a few moments to spin up the drive again and load the uh, data off the drive. First question, uh, language. You can also read the release notes. Um, we're going to leave that at its default value. Um, it then checks to make sure there's enough uh, drive space. It, this needs 7.2 gigabytes of space. Um, and it doesn't need to be connected to the internet. But if you are connected to the internet, it will download packages off the internet so you get a slightly more up-to-date system. You can also do that later after you've installed Linux Mint. Um, it's not mandatory. Um, now the next step I think is where we're going to have to decide on, on where it's going to be installed and that, that's where we start to um, worry about whether it's going to uh, replace Windows 7, whether it's going to be alongside Windows 7 um, or something else. Um, so you can see that Linux Mint has detected that uh, Windows 7 is installed, that we thought this is probably going to be the most common setup for most people. Um, what we want to make sure happens is that it puts it on the separate drive. Um, so often install Linux Mint alongside Windows 7 will work, but it may also resize the drive on its own if, it, if, if you're not telling it exactly what to do. So we're going to uh, select something else, select Continue. And then we're going to make sure it gets the right drive. So here, SDA1 is in fact the Windows drive. Um, and you can see that NTFS is actually the file system used by Windows. SDB is the completely blank second drive that we're going to use um, for Linux Mint. So you need a minimum of two uh, partitions. They're the kind of spaces you create on your partition uh, for storing files. You need one which you call root, um, and that has a mount point of slash. That's going to store everything. We're not going to have a separate place for our personal files. It's all going to be stored on the root partition. And we're going to make that uh, 10 gig. Um, leaving a, um, a little bit of space left over for the swap drive, which we're just adding partitions, um, and then you just tell it that you want the remaining space to be the swap partition. Um, the nice thing about this overview is you can see what information is going to be overwritten. So it's only going to be SDB1, the partition we just created, that's going to be formatted and it's going to be formatted using the default selection, which is a file system called ext4, which is the best option for anything. Really, it's the standard Linux file system before this came, ext3 and ext2. You can experiment with other operating systems. It's quite good fun. But we're just going to go down the tried and tested route. You need to have one mount point, which is this slash, which means root, which means everything. Um, and then you can go ahead and click on Install Now. It will uh, format that partition we just created. Uh, that's where you lose all data that would have been on there um, and then start copying the files. Cleverly, it does all that in the background while it asks you a few simple questions, starting off with where you are. It looks like it's guessing this by the IP address. 
Um, we're not up in Scotland, but it doesn't really matter as long as you get the right time zone. It's, it's actually quite good fun to play around with this. You can, because it's quite a good visual indication of what time zones actually are. And some of these are weird. Um, who'd have thought that's the same as the UK time zone? But anyway, London for our time zone. Next option, we're going to be asked about our name. Um, oh no, no, next option, we're going to be asked about uh, the keyboard setup. Uh, because there can be some ambiguity in this. Uh, luckily, it's detected the default values, but especially if you're using some European keyboards with uh, with some accents on the character, then you may want to go through this detect keyboard layout system, um, which fine tunes and makes sure the keyboard that you're using is the right one. And we're just going to click on continue. Um, I think the next thing that we're asked now is for um, our name. Um, and then a name for an account on the computer. So a real name is used to default things like email. Um, and it's also used in the, the account manager. And so let's just put Linux voice for this. Um, your computer name, we're doing this in a virtual machine, so it's already come up as VirtualBox. But let's call it Linux Mint. You most often see that on your router if you use one at home um, where a, a system or an IP address has been identified according to the name given to it on the network. And this is this is what you'll see um, there. Um, username, um, it's Linux because it's taken it as our first name. It could easily be Graham. Um, that's what you need to actually log into your system um, if you have require my password to log in set. If you set this to login automatically, you won't even be asked. But behind the scenes, you'll still have this your, your username. And that can become a consideration if you then start to use your machine as a server on the internet. So if you want to get access to your machine from the internet, it's typically your username and this password that you'll use. Um, um, so it makes a lot of sense to make this as powerful as um, as strong as possible, a password doesn't do it. Password um, with some numbers and a capital letter. It says it's. Uh, let's just just. You can spend some time playing with that. And it, um, log in automatically. That's fine if this is your machine at home and it's not going anywhere. If it's a, a laptop, I guess you may be slightly wary that if somebody opens up, if you if you happen to leave it somewhere and somebody opens it up, um, and turns on your computer, they'll be able to access your desktop without doing anything else. Um, if you encrypt your home folder and you set require my password to log in, um, even if they do have access to your hard drive and even if they do have access to the laptop, you should be relatively safe. Um, but for our home desktop machine, we're not going to bother with the encryption, although we will ask it to log in because it's another stage that we can show in the next video. Um, I think that's about all you're asked for with Linux Mint. It's a remarkably simple installation process. Um, three questions. In the background, all the files are already being installed for us. Um, if you're connected to the internet, it will also download a load of updates for you. Um, it's now just a case of uh, waiting, um, usually only five or six minutes. Um, I'm not going to let the video, I'm going to cut the video at this point, cut to when the section is. But if you want to see how long it's going to take on this virtual machine, let's look. It's now 11 minutes past six. Um, so I'll come back to the video when we're closer to this copying progress bar being up this end. Um, and in the meantime, you can just flick through some of the, uh, the nice illustrated features that you're going to be able to enjoy once Linux Mint is up and installed on your machine. OK, I'm back. In fact, the progress bar got to the very end. Uh, then it started again uh, with installing system. And I think at the moment it's just doing some uh, housekeeping. You can actually check for more detailed output by clicking on this small down arrow. Um, you can see this is too technical for a, it doesn't matter. But you can actually see that it's downloading some extra stuff from the internet and installing language packs is, is what it's telling us it's doing. Um, I've got the feeling it, it isn't going to take long from this stage, depending on uh, the speed of our internet connection here. Um, you might notice here that 
Um, it's downloading packages from Ubuntu, from uh, the Ubuntu uh, servers. Um, and that's because Linux Mint is a, a derivative of Ubuntu. It's built upon uh, the Ubuntu distribution itself. Um, there are some significant changes, but it still heavily relies upon uh, the effort that goes into creating Ubuntu, um, the distribution itself, and of course, um, in terms of packages and servers and bandwidth, a lot of that comes from Ubuntu servers as well as Mint's own for all of the changes that it offers. But it also means that you get an incredible breadth of packages and great hardware support, as well as uh, a different user interface. That's what Linux Mint is all about. Um, this desktop environment is, is, uh, is different to Ubuntu. Um, it's got a slightly different ethos as well. Um, so configuring hardware, um, let's come up with a wine configuration panel there. Hopefully that won't be long to go. Um, that's creating the, uh, well, technical terms, it's creating the, the, um, RAM, the RAM disk file system for, for when the system boots. And there's the bootloader. That's the boot menu that's added onto the hard drive that you're booting your system off. Um, it should automatically detect Windows if you have it installed um, and present you with an option of choosing between Windows or Linux. Um, if you have another version of Linux installed, it should automatically detect those as well and add those as menu options. Um, if you add Windows after you've installed Linux, it won't be as polite. Um, so it'll usually overwrite that menu um, and you won't be able to choose Linux. You will have to then go back into a live environment like this um, and find a way of repairing the boot block. It's, it's very easy to do, but I don't want to go into too much detail here. We can easily do that as a, another video tutorial at another date. Um, seems to be coming to a halt. The, um, just looking at the time down here, that's about five minutes on from where we left it after the description show. So it's taken something similar to 15 minutes to get to this state. Um, installation logs, that must be very close to the end. Aha, that's it. So installation finished. We can choose to carry on using this environment and then restart the machine whenever we're ready, or we can restart now and check out our new native installed Linux Mint environment. I'm going to do that now so that we can test to make sure that the boot menu is installed correctly and detected Windows 7 correctly, because I think that's what a lot of people are going to be doing, um, and show you that it, hopefully it's as easy as selecting Min Linux Mint to get into your new Linux machine. Let's click on restart now. Okay, well, uh, I couldn't get a screen capture working on that, uh, the beginnings part of uh, the boot process there. Um, when I restarted, it ejected the optical drive, um, came up with the BIOS screen, and then a fraction of a second later, it has uh, shown me the boot menu with Windows 7, if you want to uh, load back into the Windows environment, or here we've got Linux Mint 16 ready to go uh, as we just installed it. Um, that's all there is to it. Um, the next video, I'll show you first steps with Linux Mint 16, um, simple processes of how to use it, what kind of apps you can install to do um, all the things that you might be used to. Um, and it's gonna be the next step of a great adventure. So um, thanks for watching um, and I'll see you then, bye.